Well, good evening, everyone. We are very pleased to tonight to have Sandy Crot from the um, Hidden uh, Invisible Power um, and from the Insight Principles to tonight available for a webinar. Um, Sandy has, uh, has also had a long, long experience of the principles and especially in the business domain. So we are very keen on hearing what she has to say. Sandy, the floor is yours. Ah, well, thank you very much and good evening. Good evening, everybody. Ah, yes, when, when Zwer, um emailed me and he said, uh, you are at least the last two speakers have You've been featuring what he called the pioneers of the three principles, which personally, I, I like that term much better than the other term that I have heard, which is the old timers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the pioneers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for the pioneers. And you can retire the old timers. Um, but I have to say, I was reflecting on this, this this morning, how different it is today uh, encountering this understanding, sharing this understanding, um, promoting this understanding um, compared to when I first met Sydney Banks which was in 1981. Because of course in 1981, there was no internet, there was no Zoom. Um, there were no books. There, there were, if you were lucky, you had access to some very badly made audio tape, if you were lucky. I mean, there were they were few and far between. And they were like, boot, we call it bootleg, bootleg recording. They were made by somebody, uh, you know, I don't know, on some cheap recording system. So you could barely, you know, you could barely hear them. But that was it. That was it, of course, and um, and you would listen to Sid, who would only speak maybe twice a year. Now, don't get me wrong, I am thrilled with how many opportunities people have to encounter this understanding. I'm thrilled at how user-friendly we're trying to make uh, uh, this understanding for people. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled with all the books that are available out there and the recordings. And, and by the way, the fact that more and more of Sid's materials are becoming available to the general public. Um, that's fabulous. I, one of the things that re required of us in those early days, because we had nothing, we had no resources, was the learning was very much between me and me. And of course, that's always where the learning is. And it, it's helpful to hear, you know, hopefully it'll be helpful to hear what I have to say. Um, it's going to be helpful to hear what all the other principles practitioners have to say. It's going to be wonderful to read people's books. But ultimately, what we're looking for is something that's already inside of us. And so we have to be able to, we have to be willing to look. And because we had nowhere else to go, we had to look inwardly. And so we did, and I did. 
I felt kind of lonely a lot of the time. Um, but it, in some ways, it, it um, accelerated my growth. So um, again, again, I don't, I please don't ever hear me say that it's too bad we have all these resources because it's not. But don't ever forget where the answers are really going to lie, and where where the um, where the work, if you want to call it that, is going to happen. It's always going to happen inside. Sid used to say all the time. He used to say this all the time, and it it it, it would frustrate me when he'd say it. And I I think. I'm getting a glimmer now, 40 plus years later, what he meant. He used to say, point yourself in the right direction and do nothing. And, you know, that's frustrating to hear. What do you mean, do nothing? Um, I got, you know, I got problems. Uh, I, I, I got to do something. Tell me what to do. And, you know, as you're learning this understanding, it isn't about what to do. It isn't about a doing. It's about an understanding. So do nothing means that you're you're not going to you're not going to make yourself have an insight. You're not going to make yourself learn something. It, it, it's not in it's not really in your control. However, the other part of that sentence. Point yourself in the right direction. That's an is e equally important part of the sentence as the do nothing part. And the point yourself in the right direction is what what I'm talking about. You you have to look inwardly. You have to look. toward your own experience, toward your own life, toward you, toward what you're, what you, what you want to know and what you want to see, um, and away from the problem or what looks like the problem or the circumstances or the situation or what's not working, even though that's where we want to look. So I want to tell you a little bit about, I, you know, I don't, some, I, I don't know how many of you heard me speak before, so I apologize if you've heard my story before, but I, I want to share it um, because it's, I think it's illust illustrative of um, what happens to many people, in, including the clients that you might have, when they first encounter this understanding and try to make sense out of it. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you, like I said, I, I had the great good fortune of meeting Sid in uh, many years, 1981. Um, it was, uh, it was really, I, I often refer to it as just dumb luck. I was just lucky because uh, I almost, I almost blew it. I almost didn't let it in. So at the time, just the year before 19, towards the 1980, by that time, I had been in the field of mental health counseling for five years. And I was disillusioned and burned out after five years and ready to leave the field. And I was not a happy person. But you know, the fact that I was unhappy and the fact that I was burned out in a way made sense to me. Because I thought that 
problems were coming and were created by the circumstances of your life, your past, you know, uh, what's happened to you, other people. And so I looked around at my life and my circumstances and my past. Of course I was going to be happy, unhappy. I had a list of reasons. So I was unhappy. I was burned out. But in a way, I was okay with it because I, I understood it. I, I just justified it. So I, mean, I, I have a little um, illustration. I, I do a lot of, I work with business. That's, that's my, um, for the last 20 years, I've been working with uh, in, in business, which we can talk about later. So, um, and, and of course the last few years I've had to work on Zoom. And so I've developed uh, some pictures that I've used on Zoom. So one of the pictures that I've used with, with my business clients this is how I looked at life. I thought my my whatever was happening, whatever was in, whatever was visible, whatever I could see or had seen, that was the source of my problems, and it was gonna be the source of my solution. So whatever relief I got, and I did get some from time to time, whatever relief I got was also going to come from outside, from the visible. So for me at that time, I was in my 20s, um, I, I got very fond of drugs and alcohol. <laughs> they were really uh, a solution that I came up with for my unhappiness. And the other, the other thing that I discovered was the wilderness. I discovered the wilderness. I discovered that my mind got quiet when I was out in the forest, when I was out in the mountains. And so I got out in the mountains and into the forest as much as I could. So my typical life was I, I struggled, was unhappy and irritated, bothered, miserable, Monday through Friday afternoon. And then Friday afternoon, I'd either imbibe in alcohol and drugs for the weekend, or I got out into the wilderness. And that was pretty much it. But I, I had finally decided, look, I, I got to get out of the mental health counseling field because that, it, it, this is not this is not fun. Um, and the people in the field are all unhappy, just like me. Well, then I meet this person who's in the field of counseling, just like me working with the exact same client that I'm working with and she's happy and she's getting results. And I couldn't quite figure it out. And so I invite her to coffee. So she and I were working at a at the time we were working at a place it was a shelter for run for, for teenagers who had either run away from home been thrown out of their house or had been removed from their home by the state and we were doing family counseling and my families were i i felt like a referee more than a counselor because I couldn't, I could barely keep them in the room. And her families, sometimes I noticed they would come out of her office with their arms around each other. So I asked her, by the way, just 
you might, her name is Rita Shuford, and you might want to add her to your list of pioneers to speak with because she's still practicing. She, li she lives in Hawaii, so that's a even harder time zone to deal with because <laughs> that would be 12 hours different from you. Um, but uh, if, you, if you can figure out a time, she's wonderful. My best friend now. But anyway, back then I take her for coffee and I say to her, what modality are you using with your clients? And she says, oh, I don't use a modality. And I said, well, what do you do? And she said something like, now this is 40 plus years ago. I still remember this conversation because it was so stunning to me. She said something like, well, I teach my clients that there's a good feeling that lives inside of them. And the only reason they don't feel it is because of their thinking. Because of what they're thinking in the moment. But for that thinking, they would be happy. And then, I, so I hear this and I'm like, yeah, so what else do you say? And she said, that's about it. I just say that in a lot of different ways. I said, well, what about their pathology? What about family systems? And she said, oh, I don't talk about that. I said, well, what professor did you learn this from? What university did you learn this from? What book did you read this? And she said, well, I learned it from, I learned it from a welder with a ninth grade education named Sidney Banks. Now, can you, can you, I'm just absolutely incredulous. But there's something about results that I just couldn't dismiss. So she's getting results and she's happy. So she says to me, here, I have, and she pulls out a cassette recording, cassette tape. And she says, here, here's a cassette tape of Sydney Banks. You might want to listen to it. So I, I'm game. So I, I take it home and I, I try to listen to it. And first of all, it's, it's a bad recording. So it's very distorted. The sound is bad. Second of all, he talks to the Scottish brogue. I couldn't. And third of all, what is he talking about? He, I, I could not. I could not compute. I could not get it. He was talking about the allness and the oneness and the isness and the nothingness. <laughs> I just said, forget it. So I give it back to her like, no, thank you. And, but I kept having coffee with her. <laughs> and she would share more, you know, little tidbits and, Probably two or three months go by, and she, then she says, well, you know, hey, Sydney Banks is coming to speak at the local university. Do you want to come? And it costs money, and I'm like, I don't think so. But I, I just, all right, I'll go. So I go to hear him speak. January, I remember this, like, again, like it was yesterday, January of 1981. And I walk into this room filled with happy people. They were all like Rita. They were all happy. And I was so insecure. I was so frightened. I was so uncomfortable. I could barely sit in my chair. So I have such compassion 
for people who come across this understanding and get frightened because I was, that was me. And Sid started to talk and I, he looked weird to me. He sounded weird to me. He spoke for two days. I left after the first day. I could not. I barely, I made myself stay for the first day, That, but I couldn't stay. I couldn't come back. I went skiing. <laughs> the second, I went skiing because I, I had to, I had to calm down. And fortunately for me, Rita, bless her heart, asked me, you know, where, where, where was I? And I told her I couldn't, that was just too weird for me. And she was fine with it. She was just like, oh, okay. And for the next nine months, she and I had many, 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 many cups of coffee. And she would share more and more. And I even sat in on some of her sessions. And slowly, 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 I, let, I started to let in the possibility that there was something, there was something here that, that had some answers for me. Maybe. And then, so that was January, and so I, all the way until the following November, she said, well, you know, Sid is speaking again. Would you like, this time he was speaking, he had, we had to drive a distance to go hear him. Um, would you like to come? And I, I said, yeah. Now, the second time was a completely different experience for me, completely different. Sid looked like a different person. He looked like a normal person to me. And the first time I saw him, he looked weird. Second time, he looked like a normal person. He spoke for, again, for two days. I only remember one sentence that he said. But it was a sentence that went through my body like a bolt of lightning. It, I heard it and my whole body vibrated. I felt like it vibrated. And I had this experience of, and I remember saying to myself, oh my God, that's true. I just heard the truth. But I didn't know what it meant. I knew it was true, but I didn't know what it meant. What I heard him say was, you live in a world of thought. That's what I heard. You live in a world of thought. But I, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do with that? I, I couldn't answer those questions. And after the seminar, I asked a bunch of people, I asked Rita, what does that mean? And you know, she tried to answer it, but it didn't help me. And so I just, I went back to my life and every once in a while I would get, it would come to my mind. You live in a world of thought. But nothing. And then one day, I don't know, several months later, I just had a moment of realization. And I knew what it meant. I just, I, because I went from feeling absolutely miserable. And I thought I knew why, you know, I had my list of circumstances, who to blame, what was the problem. I, I had it, I was absolutely certain, clear. 
And then at some point, I felt fantastic. And none of this had changed. Not one thing had changed. But now I felt fantastic. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, that's what he means. You live in a world of thought. Oh, my God, that's what it means. That was my very first insight. And to be honest with you, I think it's been my only insight. I just keep having it <laughs> over and over and over again. In fact, I was just saying just where when we started, I think I had it again this morning. Because, you know, we're um I had a lot going on this morning and um I, I was kind of on a very tight schedule to make sure I was had uh, ready for for you all. And um I like to get my dog we have I have a dog and uh walk him we walk him every morning and my husband and I were walking him and my husband, he, he is absolutely allergic to rushing. He cannot rush. He does not rush. He will not rush. He refuses to rush and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we're late for the movie. It doesn't matter if I have to get this, sit down with you guys. It doesn't matter. He cannot, he will not rush. So we're, you know, he's dawdling and, I'm like, I can feel myself get irritated and impatient. And if you ask me, what is the source of your irritation and impatience? I would have told you. It's him. So I have had that insight deeply and profoundly. And I forget it every day. But I know the difference because I can tell you this story. I know that what happened to me this morning was just a momentary, a moment of forget forgetfulness versus what I saw when I had my insight, which was a moment of truth. And what I saw what I saw was the real source. Where where the where where the where is the power? I saw where the power really exists, where where it all really comes from. That's the gift that Sid brought to the world. And I think sometimes it can get a little overlooked because so much of the message of the principles can be spoken of in, uh, in familiar phrases and in, um, in, in, with examples and messages that have found very familiar. In fact, Sid used to say, look, this isn't new. This, under, this has been around since the beginning of, the wise have said this since the beginning of time. But what Sid brought to the table were principles. He brought principles to the table for the very first time. We never had uh, truth expressed in such a definitive way that we could rely on to explain what was going on. And so even though I forget, <laughs> I forget all the time, I, I can fall back on the principles. 
I can fall back on what's actually true. Now, we do this all the time with gravity, you know, that gravity, the principle of gravity, we can forget, in a way, forget gravity, but we know it and we rely on it. We rely on gravity being a fact. Every time you get out of bed in the morning, you don't have to worry that your feet are going to hit the ground. You don't have to make accommodation. You know they're going to hit the ground. It's a principle. You can't do anything about it. Well, when you know that mind, thought, and consciousness are behind the scenes, not only bringing you the experience you're having in this moment right now, not only is that true, which is mind-blowing to, to realize that the experience you're having is not being created by what's happening out here. That's not how it works. It's being created by these principles in the moment, every moment. To know that is mind, it's, it's life altering. But it also, to also know that this creative process is available all the time and it is fueled by or made possible by or um, brought into life by the energy and intelligence of all things. It just, it doesn't get any better than that. It means that we have within us access to the intelligence of all things. So when you, when you know that, when you, see that as a fact, even if you forget it once in a while, which you will, which I do, to remember it e eventually, to have it come to mind, to um, fall back into it, to uh, rely on it, to count on it, it, it it's, a, it's a completely different life. I can't, I can't even compare the life I had before my insight to the life I have now. It's, 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 two, it's two, different, two different lives. I, 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 get, a, I get a glimmer of it because I'm a twin sister. We're not identical twins, but we are... Um, you know, we're born my born fifteen minutes apart, so we shared our entire growing up, same parents at the same time, same two older brothers. We shared the same bedroom. We, I mean, we everything uh, of our of her life was the same for the first eighteen years. So I went away. We went away to different universities and. Um, who hasn't had the insight I have. And so I see her, it's kind of in a way sad, but in a way perfect um, to watch her interact with our past. We've had very similar pasts, of course, um, in the family, we have the same family. And, and to watch her maneuver and and navigate that versus how I maneuver and navigate it um, because of what I understand. It's just two different, completely two different lives. So I get reminded 
<laughs> all the time. And I'm very grateful uh, for what I've, I've come to see. Now that's not to say that you won't encounter difficulty in life. It's not to say that bad things aren't going to happen or have happened to you. I think sometimes when people hear uh, the principles um, and hear us describe the, the inside out nature of our experience that that it's happening from the inside out. Sometimes people hear that as, as us dismissing tragedy or injustices and calling them, well, that's just thought. I just actually, worked with a group last week. It's a very interesting experience for me because I, like I said, I typically, I have for the last 20 years worked with executives and um, leadership teams in businesses. But last week I, I did some volunteer work with uh, um, an organization here in the United States that teaches this understanding in prison in, uh, with incarcerated men and women. And I, I did a, a, a staff retreat for them. And of the 15 people on the staff, uh, like half of them have been incarcerated, have been in prison and have had really Really, really, really tough lives. Really heart heartbreaking, heartbreaking lives. And yet they um, got this program, her, learned this program in, uh, learned about the principles while they were incarcerated and heard something that completely changed them so much so that when they were finally released from prison, they wanted to work. They wanted to do this work with other, with other prisoners. So it's quite a transformation. And yet they still struggled with the idea that they were hearing me, they, they were wondering if I was saying, look, you, you don't know what I went through. You have no idea the, the life that I had. One of them, his son was actually murdered in a gang murder um, while he was incarcerated. And he wasn't even allowed, he could, he, they let him out to go to the, his son's funeral, but he had to attend in, in, in shackles. He had handcuffs on his arms and on his feet, on his legs. And that is so, still to this day, so gripping to him. And he was hearing me, I, he keeps he keep hearing, that's just your thinking. And so I, I got a new appreciation last week for how people hear our message and how careful I, I sometimes, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I got a new um, respect for how, for my, how I word things without taking away from the fact 
that no matter what happens to us, including the tragedies and the injustices, our experience of it in the moment can only come to us via these principles. That's it. That's the only way we can have an experience. It does, there's, it, you, you, can't, you, you can't know life any other way. That doesn't mean there's a right way to do it or a wrong way to do it. It just means that whatever thought, consciousness brings to you, your mind in that moment, that's going to be your experience. And you have to come to peace with that, whatever it is. And the way you come to peace, the way I've come to peace with it, the way I've come to peace with the tragedies and the injustices that have happened to me is that I know that I can have a new thought about it. It doesn't mean that, that it's going to make the thing that happened go away. It still, it still happened. I can't unmake it happen. That, that man's son is still dead, shot in a gang war. He's not coming back. But he can find a way. He can hear. He can receive a new thought that will help him make sense of it, help him find peace with it, help him uh, see it differently. That's the gift of the principle. So it's it's both, and we we have to remember to say both, not just the fact that our experience is coming from the inside out. That's the truth. And we, when you see it, your life changes. But you also want to remember you are a walking, talking, creative process. And the capacity to have a new thought is always with you, always. Under any circumstances, I don't care if you are lost and have been lost for 50 years. It doesn't matter. Any moment you can have an insight, any moment a new thought can come to mind. And and that's that's the hope for humanity. That's the hope for me. <laughs> wow, I talked longer than I thought I was going to. So let me stop here um, and see if there's any questions or uh, or comments or stories or observations or anything you guys would like to share. Please raise your hand if you want to ask or state something. And so we can give you a turn. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Hi. So good to see you and everybody else. Uh, that's a treat. I just heard about this this morning. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, what I... It's a bit of a tangent, but what I thank you, by the way, so much for your for your story. I hadn't heard it before. Uh, it's, it's always really enriching to to uh, see someone else's trajectory with this. <clears throat> um, what I wanted to ask you is from your um, from your current experience with with people. But uh, it's since you're working in business, I'll talk about business is. Um, I was wondering when you go uh, and, and come in contact with a company and you you do what you do and you help them um, see something for themselves. Um, do you go in there and 
look for something that they can get rid of? Or do you not come in there with any preconceived notion whatsoever and it's just you're going to show up and that's it? And I'm asking this specifically on the outside in part of the of the paradigms. Like, are you or at least like is that a focus? Or um is that something that you've learned through experience that well that's useful and it's helpful, but maybe for business that not that's not that might be limiting to just focus on that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. And and um um I think it is a little different. I mean, I, it is a little different working, uh, bringing this understanding into business versus uh, offering this to the general public, because usually the general public is going to show up voluntarily because they're interested. Um, and by and large, the audiences that I work with on business, not interested. <laughs> And so um, I, part of my job is to is to to build a bridge between where they are and where where I want to take them. And so what we at Insight Principles have always done is we we try to partner with our our business clients. So we'll come to we'll come meet with them, and they're going to tell us what's wrong. They're going to tell us what problems they have. And we're, we are all ears. We really do want to listen to what their problem And then we want to understand their problem as best we can. Because if we just go in there without knowing what their problem is and just uh, say things like, um, oh, yeah, we're going to teach you how your mind works. Most of the time they're going to say, hey, look, I already know how my mind works. Thank you very much. Um, oh, we're going to teach you how to use your mind better. Hey, I don't, look, I probably make five times more money than you do. I think my mind works pretty darn good. So um, we don't do that. We what, what, what are you struggling with? What are your problems? Tell me about. Tell us about it. And we really want to understand it. So we... We ask a million questions and we we try to get a real sense of how they see their pro what they see about their problem, how much we're, we're kind of looking for what they understand about humans and about the human dimension. Um, what they think the human the human the human element of the problem is if they think there is one because if they think there isn't one at all we're probably not going to help them so why why would we waste our time if this company says oh it's just the economy and you know as soon as the economy changes and that's it well yeah we're just or it's just a supplier or something, you know, if they're not willing, they're not interested at all in the human part of the problem, then we're, we're probably not going to help them. So we're listening for what do they understand about the human part of the problem? And, and so as, as we, as we ask more questions and discover what they understand about it, we try to build a bridge between what they already suspect about the human part of the problem and how we can help them with the human part of the problem. So we'll let them know that And again, something they, they sort of already know. We will say, look, you know, one of the definitions of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And the only reason we do it the same thing over and over again is because we don't see anything new. And one of the things 
our program, one of the outcomes of our program is that people see something new. And when you see something new, the problem looks different. And when the problem looks different, new solutions come to mind. And that's intriguing to people. So they want to know, um, what do you mean people see things differently? And then we'll, then we'll, we, so now they're like interested, you know? Well, it turns out you can, you know, actually we can teach people um, uh, we can teach people about how their minds work such that it makes it easier for them to see something new. Really? You can teach people that? Yeah. Actually, we, all, we are fully capable of seeing things new. Little kids see things new all the time. We started out that way. We just kind of, we're just out of shape for it. We just learned a lot of bad habits. And we have a lot of misunderstanding. And so in our programs, we, we're we going to correct some of the misunderstanding. And then your mind is going to do what it's designed to do, which is to see something new. And that's going to solve your problem. So we, so you can see, I try, I, I, ha, I have to, build the bridge between this world and this world. <laughs> but I I've got to I've got to respect that this is where business is living. And by the way, it's not just business. I mean your clients are coming in with they've got real problems. And and I, I appreciate that you don't want to sit there and get into their problems with them. That's not healthy. Um, and you don't want to take their problems on. But you also, you can't dismiss them. Because these are, this is, people are really attached and struggling and they, they feel disrespected if you say, well, you know, that's just your thinking. That that answer your question, Hank? Oh, yeah, and then some. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? I was listening to you, Sandy, and I something occurred to me. When I talk to leaders in organizations, they have most of the time quite a, quite a lot of experience with working with people. And what I find is they are much closer to understanding the principles than they often know themselves. Um, and it's amazing how easy you can hook into that. Um, because then you can make sense to them. And that's what they're looking for all the time. How do you feel about that? Well, people in business, especially people who are successful business people, they didn't, you don't get there by accident. You got there by having insights. And they, but people don't really recognize that that's what it is. And so what gets the credit? Well, hard work gets the credit. Uh, good investments get the credit. Um, uh, you know, they're all, thing, all kinds of things get the credit. Mm -hmm. But when you point out, you know, let's 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 put credit, let's get the credit where credit is due. You remember you had an insight. Do you remember that? Remember when you saw something no one else saw? Remember when that happened? And everybody does. Everybody remembers those moments. Of course, it's the most human thing in the world. And so they just don't know the, they don't understand the mechanism of it. 
So it's like magic or it's, it's not dependable. And you're going to show them, well, yeah, it is like magic, but it's dependable. It's dependable magic. You can actually uh, count on it. And you can also just uh, uh, have an operating culture that discourages it mm -hmm. innocently. And, and you know, a lot of companies are innocently set up <laughs> to discourage insight. They don't even see it. But, you know, there's no time for reflection. No time for quiet. Everybody's caught up in the details. You 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 go you look at an agenda of an. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll look I'll look at an agenda that a leader has set for his or her staff meeting. I'll look at it and I say, how long is the staff meeting? Oh, uh, forty minutes. Really. <laughs> This is your agenda for a 40 minute staff meeting? It's ridiculous. But they don't see it. So, um, so yeah, so we have to help them understand. We use the term a lot. Uh, I don't know. I think it's because my, my, one of my partners in crime, Robin Sharbet, is an engineer. <laughs> so, um, he calls it the mechanics of the human mind. And it's a kind of a catchy term, but it's like the mechanics. We show them the mechanics. And just like the mechanics of your car, you don't expect to drive your car without fuel. Now, I mean, eventually everybody knows what's going to happen. But for some reason, we human beings think we can operate without any few, any mental psychological fuel. No problem. So they they learn they learn um, when they under, begin to understand the mechanics. Like, what were we thinking? We can't do that in a forty minute staff meeting. So instead of 25 agenda items, they have five. It's not good and that, that's just, a, that's a simple, that's just a little practical thing. But, mm. um, yeah. yeah. I had um, a, a similar experience recently. I was coaching a few people from a construction, construction company. And for some, and, and the funny thing is that the director who sent the first one to me now got interested because what are you doing to these people? What's going on here? <laughs> so I invited him home to have a chat. We had a chat of two hours and he was stunned, really. And um, he also promised me, promised to send me a few more to a client. So that's, that's wonderful. But it is so amazing that this is um, if you find the wording right, it's so easy to understand. But you have to relate to the person who's opposite. You do. You do. And and how you got you got to get to know them. You have to listen. You have to listen to your clients. Yeah. Let them talk first. Yeah. They're um they're gonna tell you how to talk to them. That's sure. um and and, that's and yeah, learn to listen. Mavis Khan has a wonderful listening course on her site, on her website. I would like to uh, to, to bring that forward because it's a one of it's a, it's free. You can just go there and it's and, and Mavis is wonderful. So it's, it's fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. And so she, I would... told, she told this great story once. I don't know if it's on her course because it happened many years ago. I've known Mavis for 40 years. Um, she had an intern who was working with her who was from um, Cameroon. 
in the uh, continent of Africa. I, I forget the language they speak in Cameroon, but anyway, um, he he was he spoke that, but he spoke English. And Mavis was ha uh, working with a, a a business executive who was just a stress case, a total stress case, and going uh, just so fast in his head. And Mavis is doing her best to try to help him, but he could not slow down long enough to hear her. He couldn't hear her. So the first session happens, nothing. He comes back the second time saying, he's just, he's like, this isn't helping. This, I don't know. Hey, don't you have anything else to, besides this? What's that mean? He's just complaining and going really fast. Finally, Mavis says to her intern, she says, I want you to teach Bob the principles, only I want you to do it in your native language. And so this guy just starts teaching the principles in whatever language they speak in Cameroon. And of course, he's got this beautiful feeling on top of it. This, I knew this intern as well. And he just starts teaching the principles in a foreign language. That's more thing to you. The um, business executive, Bob, first he's antsy, and then he just settles down. And then he starts to cry. Wow. So eventually her intern stops and Mavis says, what's happening? And he says, I don't know. I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you're listening. And he said, I'm listening. I don't even understand a word he said. And she said, I know. You're, you weren't listening to the word. I've never forgotten that story. She told me that story. I, I, I really, I think it was probably 30 years ago. But yeah, we forget that the kind of listening it takes for us to really help somebody it doesn't take much. Like it was one sentence with me, Sydney Banks, you know, a whole weekend. How many sentences do you say in a weekend? I don't know. Thousands, tens, tens of thousands. I don't know. But in one sentence. And, I, and chances are with all you, you, you heard, you remember like a word, a phrase. It doesn't take a lot. But when you hear it, And when you're listening with, to your clients and you can hear them beyond the, beyond the words, either to see them, who they really are, beyond their problems, right to who they really are, or you see, you hear something. This happens to me all the time. You hear something in what they say. You hear a phrase that is a clue as to how they're misunderstanding life. And you can use it as a gateway in. So, yeah, you can't do this work without, without listening. You can't do it well. Mm. Wow. Well, it's past our a lot of time, so. Wonderful. Is there any well, anyone who yeah, would I, like, to like to do the last question? Well, it's it's time. We are over the time, so we're very pleased to have had you here. It was an amazing welcome. session. Thank you very much. You're yeah. welcome. Share. Feel free to share my email if, if a question comes up and. 
you think of it and want to um, email me, feel free. Okay. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer it in English. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Luckily, most of the Dutch, well, come on. I know. That's what's so wonderful about everybody but Americans, you know. <laughs> well, we won't ask you to speak Dutch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's horrible. It's very difficult also. Oh, well. Thank you so much. And, uh, check, check Rita out. I, I'll recommend, uh, if, if you can work out the, the time, that might be difficult. But, we'll, um, we'll, we'll see. We'll try We'll try and get, 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 get a hold of her yeah. and we'll see how we can work something out. It would be wonderful. Thank you All so right. much. Um, You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye-bye.